You'll notice on that second sheet it says number four. That is where I hope to get to today is number four. Um, but for right now, we're still going to be on that first handout. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Mark's there. Everybody else, just you can catch up. Amen. Uh, I've given you too much time. I, uh, for the sake of review, I don't want to spend too much time reviewing, but I'm going to teach on tithes and offerings this week in Sunday school, and then we'll have a regular or we'll have a, a message in the second service. Um, but I, I want to keep continuing this. This study, I, Lord's opened my eyes to several things in it. Um, and if you remember last week, we kind of gave this outline. Uh, we're on number two, I think, or three. And uh, hopefully we'll get through three and four today, but we shall see. Um, but uh, just by way of review, I want you to remember the subject. I'm just going to read this just to bring it to speed. The subject's been abused by both church leaders and, and by members as far as tithes and offerings go. Um, some leaders ask for more money than what they need, and they misuse funds. And... Um, one of the biggest, easiest ways that I would say you ought to leave a church or at grounds to leave a church is if the pastor or uh, the financial treasurers or anybody are messing with the funds, uh, that is something to be leery of um, and very, very scared uh, of what's going on. Because uh, I found out usually if somebody's messing with funds in the church, finance, this is just my own experience. I can name you about five pastors and treasurers and deacons that I know that have been involved with, I know them personally that have been involved with the money and uh, doing things bad, uh, there, are, there are sensual sins involved. Uh, so this, whenever someone's messing around with the money, I, my red flags go up because I worry that there's more sins going on. Uh, but I, I just want you to know I understand it's been abused um, in times past. And uh, then some people do not uh, believe a New Testament Christian is commanded to give financially, and we'll cover that on whether or not we're commanded to give in the New Testament and under the church age. Um, and then we talked about how many Bible believers, even good men, good teachers, teach that you don't have to give tithes and offerings. That that's not for this age. And I'm going to show you how uh, good, good men can uh, be blinded at times. Um, and it's okay. You can still listen to them, and they're great men, great teachers. I'm sure there are things that I'm blinded to that I don't see either. Um, but And then, uh, like I said before, I've been in church for 26 years. I've been in the ministry for eight years, and God has shown me many things with the subject. Uh, so I hope that it will help show you some things. And uh, like I said last week, this ought to excite us. Tithes and offerings ought to excite you. It ought to not make you nervous. Uh, you, you really should be excited about it um, if your heart's in the right place. So we talked about that last week. We talked about what is giving in the Bible. This is kind of where we uh, started last week, what is giving. And we just went through how giving in the Bible has different names, tithes and offerings, sacrifices, collection, gatherings, gift, grace, and power. We went through all those things last week and uh, how the Bible has different names uh, for giving. And then we asked this question, so that was number one, the different names that refer to giving. And then uh, this week, uh, last, last week we started on who to give to. And the two people that we covered were the poor and needy and struggling Christians. And we covered that last week. Um, and we talked about how last week there's a difference between the poor in the Bible, the poor and needy, and sluggards and slothful people. Uh, there are some people that are bums that you aren't supposed to give your money to. God doesn't want you to give your money to bums. And there's a difference between poor and needy. And if you read through those verses there in Proverbs that you have in your handout, you'll find out that a lazy man, it says, won't even bring his hand to his mouth to feed himself. Uh, he'll make complaints and say, there's a lion out in the street. I can't go outside. He always has excuses. There's always an excuse as to why he can't work, why he can't keep a job. And it's usually everybody else's fault but him um, or her. Uh, so we went through the poor and needy that we are to help. And then we talked about um, struggling Christians. You and I are supposed to help struggling Christians. And the church in Jerusalem, the reason why they got deacons was because they were not taking care of the poor and the widows. And they said, you need to get you some deacons to tend to the poor and the widows. Um, so we are supposed to help struggling Christians. We went through that last week. And I, and I told you all, you still have to be careful because even, believe it or not, even Christians will abuse that uh, that uh, office of the church, I guess, or that blessing of the church. Uh, I have people message me all the time on Facebook, message our church that says, I need money, I can't pay my electric bill, I can't do this, I can't do that, and we don't give them anything. We're not supposed to. Um, they're, they're taking advantage of the church, they're abusing it. So, uh, Struggling Christians that are trying to serve the Lord, you ought to try and help. And uh, other than that, you need to really pray over whether or not God wants you to give them, uh, someone money. So sound good? Yep. All right, we're up to speed. That was a good little three-minute Review. Now let's look over to uh, the third. The third group we're supposed to give to are ministry workers and church leaders. Turn in your Bible to First Corinthians nine. First Corinthians nine. If you got a bookmark, I'd keep one in First Corinthians nine. We'll be there quite a bit, 
And then you can keep one around 2 Corinthians 8 or 9. We'll be there as well quite a bit today. So we give to struggling Christians. We give to the poor and needy. And then we are commanded to give to those that uh, preach and teach the Word of God. So look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 7. 1 Corinthians 9, 7. Paul says, Who goeth a warfare, who goes to war, at any time at his own charges? No one ever goes to war on, on their own money. They go on someone else's money. The armies do. The militaries do. Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? I mean, if you plant something, you ought to get to enjoy it. Uh, it always makes me nervous. Amen. Chefs and cooks that don't eat their own food. Amen. I always wonder, what are you giving me? Praise God. Mark never eats his own food. It always scares me. Amen. Uh, who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? Paul saying, although I'm saying this like a man, the, man, the law says the same thing. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Uh, you know who that oxen is referring to? To me. Big bull, big oxen. Um, and he's saying an ox that treads the corn and that plows and plows in the word of God. He says, does God not take care of that oxen? He's saying this, if God takes care of that big, ugly, hairy, stinky beast that has snot dripping from it and it licks its head and flies around and it has to bat off the flies and it just smells and is awful. He goes, if God takes care of that ox, he says, is he not going to take care of the man of God? Or should we not take care of the man of God? And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about church leaders, people that labor in the word of God. Uh, in verse number 10, he says, Or saith he it all together for our sakes, for our sakes no doubt this is written, that he that plows should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we, Paul, the apostles, the rulers and teachers, uh, the pastors, the shepherds, the bishops, um, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing? Meaning, is this a hard, unbe unbelievable task? Is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He's saying, if I sow into you spiritual things and give you spiritual insight to the word of God and help you, should I not reap your carnal things? I Meaning, he's talking about monetary goods. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things. He said, we just go through things. We don't even ask any money of you. That's what he's getting ready to say here. Lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? That's Old Testament. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Notice Paul's using an Old Testament doctrine to teach a New Testament church age doctrine. Please get that. He's using the altar of the Old Testament to show how in the New Testament, he's comparing those two things to give a principle here for the church. Even so, verse 14, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have none, have used none of these things, neither have I written these things that should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a dispensation of the gospel committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power. In the gospel. What Paul is saying there in those last couple of verses is this. Uh, to the church at Corinth, they were too carnal. They were too baby. They're just too spiritually immature. He said, I haven't really abused my power in asking you for money because you really weren't able to handle it. You weren't able to bear it. And it's a picture of a carnal church that isn't able to handle giving, that isn't able to, to give to their minister. And Paul said, I could have taken money from you, but I chose not to. Uh, that way I don't hinder the gospel from working. And what he's saying is that you got to be careful as a church and as a, as, a, as a leader in a church asking for money all the time. Because uh, you don't want to make everything about money. Because then people assume that you're just a charlatan. You're just out for their money. You're like Joel Osteen or Mike Murdoch or Joyce Meyer. Uh, where you just want them to give. Or Bishop T.D. Jakes, all those guys. Uh, you just want their money. Uh, Rob Parsley is a good example. The one that's down the road there. Uh, he's always talking about love offerings. And sow a seed of faith. And God will give you a special blessing. And God will pay off your mortgage payment if you just sow a seed of faith. This, that, and the other. Um, he's abusing that. He's abusing people's money. And Paul's saying, for me to be a good witness and a good testimony, I'm not going to make this about money. Uh, that is why whenever you are handing out tracts and you're trying to witness to lost people, you don't really want to ask them for money or ask them to pay for anything. Um, that's why here at our church, uh, personally, this is the way we do things. It doesn't bother me, other churches that don't do this, but we don't take up an offering plate. The reason why is me, myself, and I know everyone else is this way. I shouldn't say that. The majority of people are this way. Whenever I'm visiting at a church and they pass out an offering plate, I feel obligated to give. 
And as a visitor, I don't want our visitors to feel obligated to give. If they want to give, they can go back there. Our faithful members know how to give and where to give. They can, they can find out how to do it. But uh, that's why we don't take up an offering. I, I just think it's a good way to kind of get a little safeguard to keep uh, people, visitors, from thinking that you're all about money. But Paul is saying here that he, he deserves the money. He deserves the tithes and offerings, but he's not going to abuse it. Look over in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. You're there in 1 Corinthians. Does that make sense to you? Um, he says, if God takes care of the oxen, will he not take care of the pastors and preachers and teachers? And he's trying to show them that biblical principle uh, that they ought to follow that was started in the Old Testament under the law. And he's saying it's still working today in the New Testament. Um, and that's very important because, like I said, a lot of people will say that we don't have to give tithes and offerings. That's Old Testament. But um, that's not what Paul taught. First uh, Timothy chapter 5, look down in verse number uh, 17. He says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Notice again, there's that ox. <laughs> and the reason I want you to get this is for that reason that I keep saying. Just because something was in the Old Testament does not mean we don't still do it in the New Testament. And a lot of Bible believers, they, they get mad at hyper-dispensationalists for dividing up the Bible and say, well, we don't need to do that. It's not under the law, this, that, and the other. Paul keeps using that Old Testament doctrine to teach a New Testament doctrine. And um, he said, notice what he says, the elders that rule well. You know, how well a man rules his church determines how well his people feed him. Y'all get that? How well a man feeds his church spiritually determines how well his church can feed him carnally. Meaning, if you have a pastor that is always struggling financially, he just might not be feeding his people spiritually. A church that is spiritually healthy will be financially healthy, and they'll be able to give. You learn that through preaching and teaching of the Word of God, how to handle and how to build character and how to develop things in your life. And he says those that rule well... Be counted worthy of double honor. I'm not going to go into it. Well, I will go into it. Let's do it. Let's sit there in the verse. Worthy of double honor. Honor, sometimes in your Bible, it doesn't always just mean you, you pay respect to them. Honor means uh, giving, paying. Double honor, I believe personally, is whatever the average person makes in your area, I believe double honor is double that. Whatever the average income is in your area, however people are honored in your area financially, I believe the minister should make double that. The way I do things whenever I pay other pastors and preachers and evangelists that come through here and missionaries, I add up how much time they had to spend preparing a message, driving here, how much time they spent in gas, how much time they will spend here preaching with us. And what I do is, is I take minimum wage in Ohio, which is $10 and some cents, and I double that. And we pay them at least that. That's double honor. And sometimes we pay them more. That's that double honor. Now, Brother Greg Estep taught that the pastor in your church ought to make double what the highest making member makes. Now, I don't believe that, amen, but he didn't. I don't know if he actually taught that hard, but uh, there's that double honor, uh, especially they that labor in the word and doctrine. Does that make sense to you? You take care of the sheep, they'll take care of you. You take care of the sheep, they'll take care of you. And that double honor there just means that you ought to, you ought to take care of people that feed you spiritually. Hey, Miss Cookie, Hi. come on in. Miss Grace, take those kids back there to the back if they want to go. Why don't you guys go back there for, to the Sunday school class? And Miss Grace, good to see y'all. Welcome, welcome. That's Miss Grace back there. That's my wife. And there's donuts in the kitchen. There's donuts back there in the kitchen. She'll show you where the donuts are. You guys can... We're having a lesson on tithes and offerings. You guys probably don't want that. And Miss Cookie, if the older ones do want to stay, they can. But... uh. Yeah, she can take them back there and talk to them, hang out with them. I figured they'd have more fun back there, amen. We're talking about tithes and offerings. The adults don't even like that, let alone the children, amen. No, I'm joking. Y'all are being open to it. So ministry workers and church leaders, I could go on and on. Labor in the word and doctrine, meaning they ought to put forth an effort in the word of God. If your pastor is waking up on Sunday mornings and opening up his Bible and just getting up and speaking to you, that is not laboring. Uh, that's taking the cheap way out. If he's Googling sermons online, that's taking the cheap way out. Men that actually study the Word of God, he says that those men are counted worthy of double honor. You've got to rule well and labor. It's hard work. 
Um, the labor, labor is worthy of his reward. So I want to move on from that. I don't want it to be self-serving. Ministry workers and church leaders and then uh, ministries furthering the gospel. Uh, turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. This is important for us to cover because we're getting ready to talk. We're getting ready to have some missionaries in. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Ministry work. So who do we give to? Uh, the poor and needy, struggling Christians, ministry workers and church leaders. And uh, like Brother Harold said, you, you feed the sheep, your sheep will feed you. Amen. And uh, like I said, I'm very blessed. You all, uh, I don't know if some of you know this or not, but you all give me a little stipend each month for gas. Uh, the first year it was $200 a month. And uh, then the second year we bumped it, or uh, the into the second year, we bumped it up to 300 a month. That's what you all do for me right now. And uh, I'm able to work a little bit uh, right now. And Well, I work a lot, amen. I work 40 hours, but, uh, but God's taking care of all my needs, amen. Your pastor's not starving, I promise, amen. Uh, but you all take care of me. Uh, ministry workers and church leaders, and then ministries furthering the gospel is the fourth group we ought to give to. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, if you're there, say amen. 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 amen, look what it says in verse 5. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren. Um, actually, no, no, no. Go, go, back up. go back up to verse 1. Chapter 9, verse 1. For as touching the ministering to the saints. He's talking about ministering to the saints. He's talking about giving here. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them in Macedonia. I brag on you to those that are in Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago. That they were ready a year ago to give. And your zeal hath provoked very many. That's the verse a lot of folks use for faith promise, but... We won't get into that right now. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain on this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready, lest haply, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, and that we say not ye, should be ashamed in the same confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before you, so he sent men ahead of him, and make up beforehand your bounty." Meaning, gather the collections, the offerings. Whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as of a matter of bounty and not as covetousness. But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall also reap, spar shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. You sow a lot, you'll get a lot back. You sow little, you'll get little back. Every man according as he hath purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Um, let me stop here and say this in verse 6. That verse has been abused, abused very much in churches. And they say that if you give more money to the church and to this preacher, God will give you more money. That's not always the case. I, I believe that if you manage your finances well and you, you have good character and good discipline, God will increase how much he starts giving you because you're giving it away. But that being said, there are a lot of people that go broke and can't pay their bills because they are giving to all these big TV evangelists and, and people like that. And God is not giving them more money. It's a lie. The people that say, oh, no, I, I gave and God gave me more. That, that's, there are some that that happens to, but it's not to everybody. Um, so that, that, he's also talking about not just financially, but he's also talking spiritually. You will reap bountifully. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. Um, God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able, verse 8, to make all grace abound toward you, that ye having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Notice it's a good work to give. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, and he hath given to the poor his righteousness remaineth forever. Um, Whenever you give to the poor, I don't have the reference here, but it's back in Proverbs, I think, or maybe Psalms 112.9, I'm not sure. But the Bible says whenever you lend to the poor, you give to God, and he will repay thee. Uh, that's in eternity. He says his righteousness remaineth forever. Whenever you give to the poor and needy, uh, there will be something in eternity where people will know that. Um, you're going to be able to tell the people down here on earth that gave to the poor and needy. Be, it says that it remains forever. Um, now, he that, I, don't know, I don't know exactly what that is, but whatever it is, you're going to know in eternity who gave. It's going to last forever. Now, he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed grown, increase the fruits of righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which calls it through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution to all men, unto them and to all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. You know what the context is of 2 Corinthians 9? I want to read that to you. He's talking about the church at Corinth helping other churches. 
that are struggling. He's talking about giving to other ministries that are furthering the gospel. And that's what that whole chapter is talking about, is about them giving financially to further the gospel. What we're getting ready to do in this upcoming week is you're going to see four different men, and, and some of them you're going to see their wives, that are, have, they have ministries. And what their ministries are is that they are getting the gospel out to other people. And they are ministering to groups of people that you and I can't minister to. For example, Brother Yoakum. He has a children's a, a Christian school out there on the Navajo reservations out in Arizona, I believe it is. And uh, not only does he have the Christian school that's ran through that local church there, he's trying to start a men's home. And he's reaching these Navajo with the gospel of Jesus Christ and these Navajo children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I can't do that. He can because he's over there. We get the blessing of sending him money monthly, and then he gets to further the gospel in that area. The Stillwaters Boys Home will be here. Uh, they are a boys' home, a Christian boarding school where they take troubled youth that are struggling and their parents can't really train them right now or that they're just really being disobedient. Um, and they take them in and they homeschool those boys. Homeschooling meaning they give them all the education they need and then they teach them character and discipline them. And just so you know, the insurance for a child's boarding school right now is very, very high. As in it's probably like thirty to $50,000 a year insurance. You want to know why? The LGBTQ and liberals hate Christian boarding schools. They hate them. They despise them. Uh, they usually stay on a low radar. They don't put everything out on, on social media and stuff because that crowd will literally attack them. They will go there and protest at that Christian boarding school. They do not like it. They don't like it. Uh, so we are going to support them. Amen. We're going to support them. You say, why are you supporting those two ministries? I think our youth need help. I think we need to focus on our youth, especially here in America. We have, a couple, we have one foreign missionary, Brother Eugene Kosachenko. Uh, we, we support him, and he's to the Jew as well. And even to, So anyways, we support foreign missions, but I believe first and foremost, you start ministering in your local area, in your church. Then you go to your local community, Columbus, Minerva Park, Ohio, America, and then globally. That's how missions works. You take care of your own first, and then you grow and you expound upon that. Uh, so we're, that's, that's what Paul is saying here. And I want you to notice in verse 13, he's talking about you are ministering to people that are trying to get the gospel out. Look in verse 13. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your, notice these phrase, this phrase here, professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ. He is saying the fact that you are giving, it is your profession and your subjection, meaning you are submitted to the gospel of Christ, meaning you believe the gospel, the fact that you give, because you believe the gospel is what saves people and what helps people. And he says, for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. The church of Corinth gave a very generous love offering to these other churches. And that's all that he's talking about there is that you, you, you give to ministries that are trying to further the light of, or further the, light of the gospel. And because, uh, man, think about this. I have, I've tried teaching people uh, whenever I wasn't right with God and I was out of church and I was trying to do things my own way. I tried helping poor people not be poor anymore. Had some success, but not much. I tried teaching people that are depressed not to be depressed had some success, not very much. You can do it through mental health counseling and all, you know, psychiatry, psychology, all that stuff, uh, philosophy. Didn't have much success. Um, I tried showing people politically why they ought to vote a certain way. I never changed one of their minds. Y'all ever changed anyone's mind politically to agree with you? No, you never have. You sat there and talked about it. If they already agreed with you, you guys talked about the people that didn't agree with you. Uh, but you never once converted anyone to your side of the aisle, right or left, don't matter. But I know this. The one thing I have seen help people time and time and time again is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. The fact that he died for their sins, he was buried, he rose again the third day, he loved them so much that he would shed his precious blood for them. He is wanting to forgive them. He will forgive them, but he is upset with them right now because they've rejected him. And that's why they have the guilty conscience. That's why they feel hopeless and helpless. That's why their life is in a wreck. It's because they are not right with God and they are not right with his son, Jesus Christ. And if you can teach them that and show them that and the Holy Spirit opens up their heart to that and you show them that from the word of God and they put their faith and trust in him and then start growing and learning of him, learn of me, he said, and they start learning about him, their whole life can change. That is one thing that works. And that is why we want to get the gospel out. We want to help people and we want to be a part of these other ministries that are going on. Someone once said this, you make God's priorities, which is saving souls, 
and edifying the saints, building up Christians. You make God's priorities your priorities, and he'll make your priorities his priorities. The reason why God does not take care of most of people's priorities is because their priorities aren't his priorities. You care about what God cares about, and he will care about what you care about. And someone once said this, a church that hungers after lost souls will never go hungry. A church that hungers after lost souls will never go hungry. Um, Some folks might call it uh, immature or premature or irresponsible to have a missions conference and pay for missionaries to come in, give love offerings, and have special music come in, everything, whenever your church is small and only has, uh, it's only been around for two years. I say this. I say the church uh, in Macedonia, it says that they gave above their power, beyond their power, meaning they did not have the money to give, but they gave anyways in faith. What we're doing right now is, yes, we have the money for the meeting. Yes, we've been saving up for it, but do we have the 5000 for the meeting? Is that coming in monthly and everything? No, it's not. We've saved for it. We've saved a year in advance for this meeting. All the finances are all taken care of. All the bills are paid. The checks are already written out. Well, I'm going to write them out this afternoon. Everything's already done. Ain't that wonderful? It's good, it's good to prepare. Amen. It's good to save. It's good to do those things. But the point being is I've said this. I've said, God, I am kind of worried to take on three new missionaries. I'm worried. Because although we have more people coming and we have more people giving, man, as more people come, bills come, uh, expenses come. As more and more people come, man, you're buying different things and you're growing and you're developing different ministries here and there. And I said, Lord, I'm kind of worried about taking on three more missionaries this year, especially with me getting ready to go part time in a month. Kind of worries me. You know, the wonderful thing about it, God said, I know, Aaron, isn't it wonderful? Isn't living by faith wonderful? (laughs) It's almost as if I'm, t- I'm having you teach on this right now to learn the lesson yourself. That I want you to give above and beyond your power and then watch me work. Because what God most often wants to see us do is to do be above and beyond what we can do. And then God says, all right, I'll step in and I'll show you what I can do. And that's what he's talking about here with this church is that they're trying to, they're trying to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, that, that's what you ought to do. You ought to give to ministries furthering the gospel, ministry workers and church leaders, struggling Christians and the poor and needy. So that is who to give to. Who to give to? And I have all these references up there. Let's get through this. Everybody doing okay so far? I'm going through this kind of fast. I'm not trying to. I'm trying to give you a lot of information. Don't let this overwhelm you. Amen. It's all in your notes. Um, And the reason why I'm going through it fast is I want to just give you, this is a Sunday school hour. And whenever it comes to teaching the Word of God, sometimes it's about getting out a lot of information. And you grow on that, you meditate on it, and you think about it. Um, but I want to spend about 10 minutes here, 10 to 15 minutes on this, on who is commanded to give. And like I said, uh, this, is, uh, this is debated among a lot of Bible believers, a lot of good men that I love and listen to. But the question comes up today is, does a New Testament Christian have to give? Does a New Testament Christian have to give? And many people teach you do not have to give as a New Testament Christian that you can and you should. It's a good thing to do. Um, But there's nowhere where you're commanded to give. And I say this. It depends on how you phrase the question. Does a New Testament Christian have to give? It depends on, on how you phrase the question. Change the phrasing from are you commanded to give to are you allowed to give? Or are you supposed to give? Or is it clearly implied that a Christian is supposed to give tithes and offerings. Don't act, because what they do is this. This is what a lot of people say. They go, show me a verse in Paul's epistles to the New Testament church where it says a, a, a Christian is commanded to give tithes and offerings. And you won't really find it. You won't find a verse where Paul says, I, Paul, command the church in the church age to give tithes and offerings regularly. You won't find it. You know what else you won't find in the New Testament? You will not find a verse where Paul says specifically, you shall not lay with beast as thou layest with mankind. You won't find a verse in the New Testament where Paul condemns bestiality specifically. Does that mean we're allowed to commit bestiality? No. No. There's no verse on it though. So that means we must be able to do it. No, that's not how that works. It's it's greatly implied in Paul's epistles you're not supposed to commit bestiality and lay with animals as you would with man and woman. That's that's clear. Even though there's not a New Testament verse that clearly explains that, the principle's still there. 
And although there's not a New Testament verse where Paul says clearly, thou shalt give tithes and offerings weekly as they did under the law, thou shalt do in the New Testament. Okay, he didn't say that, but the implications are still really there. They're there. They're all throughout the Bible. As Brother Mark McGay, he's a preacher. He's an old preacher. He's a rough guy. He used to be a biker and stuff. Got saved, went down to PBI. And uh, he's good fr- he was good friends with Dr. Ruckman when he was alive. And um, he, he likes Doc. And he used to always say this. He goes, don't, he has a big booming voice like this. He's an old biker. He's got a big belly on him. Hey, Amen. He booms. Uh, he goes, don't be a Bible blockhead. Don't be a Bible blockhead. Meaning, don't get to a place where you can't even think practically and logically. Because you're trying to put this verse here and that verse here and this verse here, and you just miss the whole gist of what God's trying to say. The Pharisees did that. I'm going to show you that here in a minute. Uh, that, well, the Pharisees did that. Jesus was always condemning the Pharisees, saying, Have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read? Knowing that they have read, but they were missing the basic principles that God was trying to show. Um, is it a biblical principle? Here's the question. This is the real question you need to ask. Is it a biblical principle that all saints throughout every dispensation and time and age give to the Lord? Yes, it is. The saints before the law ever showed up, uh, Cain and Abel are bringing sacrifices to God. And what does Cain try to do? He tries to get out of giving what he knows he should give. He knows he should bring an animal sacrifice, and he is trying to weasel his way out of it. Um, uh, Abraham, before the law, he gives tithes to Melchizedek. That's, in, that's before the law. Under the law, I have one reference plus the 30 plus, 40 plus other references. We know that you give tithes and offerings under the law. That's not under question here. Saints, during the transition from law to grace, whenever the, uh, you're transitioning from law to grace during the Gospels, that's a transition period. It's a different time period. We'll cover dispensations eventually. And in the Gospels, you have both the law working and you have grace and faith working. Where Jesus tells a man, he says, keep the law. Do you remember what that, the, I think it's, I forget which one he does, to the, uh, the, the rich young ruler. He says, what, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, honor thy father and mother. Give to, you know, thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. He gives him the law, the law, the law. And then he says, sell all thou hast and give to the poor. During the Gospels, you have, it's a transition period. And guess what's happening in that dispensation, that time period, which we'll, get, we'll cover why people don't call it a dispensation. I found out why. Um, Luke 18, that's someone giving tithes and offerings. Luke 21, I'm not having you turn to these places. Uh, Luke 21, that is someone giving tithes and offerings. A little widow lady. Look over in Luke. Let's turn there, actually. Luke uh, 21. Is it a biblical principle? Luke 21. Where is it at? Luke 21. Uh, Luke 21. Before we read there, just to prove the point, I want to get through this point here. The transition from law to grace, people are getting tithes and offerings. The saints in the church age during the apostolic period, meaning the early church, are giving tithes and offerings, giving to the Lord. Saints in the church, after the apostolic signs, all of these are references about giving. And you have two whole chapters on it. In 2 Corinthians 8 and in 2 Corinthians 9, there are two whole chapters on giving, tithes, and offerings. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9, Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 9, Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 16, all those verses on giving in the New Testament for a Christian. And then you have uh, saints in the tribulation. And if you look over Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, I think it is, uh, they say, uh, they ask Jesus about the kingdom and everything and how, what they have to do to get righteousness and whatnot. He says, if you fed me, uh, if you fed me and if you clothed me, if you took me in whenever I was naked and this, that, and the other, um, they say, Master, how can we do this unto you? And he says, if you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it to me. Meaning, during the tribulation, if you provide financially and take care of the Jews, you can be saved. That's one of the ways to be saved. It's one, you have, you have to, oh, that's kind of sticky. So we won't get off into the weeds in that one. But point being, whenever you give and take care of financially the Jews, that is you giving to God. He goes, if you've done it to them, if you've given to them, you've given to me. So saints during the tribulation are going to give to the Lord. Saints in the millennium are going to give to the Lord. That's in Isaiah chapter 56 and 66. During the millennium, we are still going to be bringing offerings to the Lord. He's saying, I just don't believe that. Look at the references then. That's why I gave you the handouts. The only ones I don't know are giving to the Lord are saints in eternity. You can find that out for me if you want. 
that really helped me out with the study. I'm not sure if we're going to give tithes and offerings in eternity. You can study that one out for yourself. So all that being said, all these saints gave to the Lord. And you'll notice all these verses during the church age. So is it implied that you and I are supposed to give? Yes. And I'm not, I'm not, folks, I'm not trying to bash you. You all give. I've said this before. Every single person in here that's a member of this church, you all give. I'm not bashing you for it. I'm saying there are people out there, good men, that are preachers and teachers, that say that you and I do not have to give. And my thing is this. What, where do you get that from? Where in the Bible? Where in the Bible do you get that from? Paul didn't write two whole chapters on it because it's not, you're not supposed to do it. It's, it's not in all these different books of the Bible. Paul didn't get excited for the church's giving and giving tithes and offerings and giving to missions and paying their elders. He didn't get excited about those things for no reason. It must be a New Testament doctrine. And look over in Luke chapter uh, 20, uh, what did I say, 21? Is this making sense to you? Uh, Luke 21, look in verses 1 through 4. And he looked up and saw the rich man casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. I want you to notice, don't, he's like, Aaron, you're, you're making too much of a deal about money. I want you to notice that that he there, you know that's talking about? Jesus. Jesus is watching people give. Tithes and offerings at the temple. Hmm. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. I want you to notice Jesus did not condemn her, this poor widow lady, for giving. In fact, he commends her. And I said this to you before, yet on last week, I have advised people wrong in here that, that don't have a lot of money or maybe they're not making too much money right now. And I told them not to give just because I thought, I, thought, oh, I want to be nice. I, I don't want them to give. I mean, if you don't have the money, don't give. The problem is this. Jesus didn't tell this woman she shouldn't have gave. He didn't say, fellas, look at this poor widow woman. I'm going to take those two mites. I'm going to give it back to her and say, look, you don't have the money for it. Your husband passed away. You're, you, know, you, you can't take, you, no, you just take that and you take it back. He doesn't do that. He commends her for it. And he says she gave more than everyone else. Meaning Jesus didn't condemn her. He didn't tell her not to. He said she gave more. Because remember, it's not about quantity. It's about proportion and portion and the percentage. And I can go on and on about that. And I, like I said last week, man, whenever you lose your job, I understand that, is, that, that you're not prospering at that point. It says, as God hath prospered him, meaning if God isn't prospering you anymore, if he took your prosperity away, you can't give as much as what you gave before. And I get that. Uh, I'm not telling you you have to give uh, if you lost your job or something like that, or you have a you have big, big health issue and you're hurt and can't work and stuff. I'm not talking about that. Um, you're supposed to give as you are prospered. If you're not prospering, you can't give. I understand that. The last thing I'll say is this. These are all these references. Exodus 30, 15, Leviticus 14, Mark 12, and 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Everyone is commanded to give rich or poor. And that is where I've heard men teach this wrong and say it wrongly and erroneously, not meaning to, but they say if you're poor, you don't have to give anything. And the problem is that's not in the Bible. That makes sense? That's, that's not in the Bible. I understand that you can fall in hard times, and I get that. But I'm saying this, God says you get an extra blessing if you don't have it to give and you give it. That's what Jesus was teaching there in verses 1 through 4. Um, and like, like I said, I'm not trying to pump anyone for money or anything like that. I, I'm the type of person where I was just talking to someone the other day. I have a problem taking money from people. I don't like it. It makes me nervous. I, I'm, I'm bad. I'd be a terrible businessman. I couldn't sell you a bicycle. I couldn't, I, I'd give it to you. I, I couldn't sell it. I couldn't get money from you. I'm, I'm not good at it. Um, and that's why I was telling people before you know, not to give. Um, but like I said, as far as the Bible goes, that's not what Jesus taught. And that's not what Paul taught. Paul taught the early young church, the church at Corinth, gave. And if you remember, they were poor, and they still gave to the mission work. Um, and like I said, that challenged me because I thought, Lord, our church is young. Uh, we have money, but we don't have you know, a whole lot of money. I said, should we be taking on these missionaries? And the Lord said, yes. You do it and see what I'll do. Um, so I'm confident God will take care of everything. Um, does that make sense to you? Do you might have any questions about anything? Nope. Ms. Cookie, do you have something? I saw a little hand go up. You always got questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I think it's a good, uh, it's up there um, where I have proportionally. Um, and I, I'll cover that probably next week, or uh, I was going to do it Thursday night. Um, it was 10% tithes and offering. It's 10% tithe. That's what a tithe is. It's 10%, one-tenth. Um, so you take you know, your, your income and take 10% of that. That's a tithe. Um, and I, I was going to teach on it next week. Um, I think it's a good place for us to start in the New Testament. Um, I believe grace is greater than the law. And uh, Jesus gave so much more than a tithe whenever he died on Calvary. I do believe in the New Testament you ought to give more than 10% myself. But I think it's a good starting point. I tell people to start there. Start with 10%. And then say, you know, pray and help, ask the Lord to help you be able to increase a little bit over time. Uh, so maybe like six months goes by and you try and increase that to 12%. Um, I, I know men that give 30% or have given 30%. Uh, J.C. Penney gave 90% of his income. The man that started J.C. Penney stores, he gave 90% to, uh, to the Lord. J.C. Penney. Um, I, I, I give above 10%, but it's because I want to make sure I don't fall below it. Amen. In reality, if you count net and gross, we'll talk about all that next week. But um, maybe. Um, but yeah. That's a good question. A lot of people ask that. Anything else? We'll take a break. There's donuts and coffee, water. But uh, like I said, Amen. It's an exciting subject, given to the Lord. Hi, Miss Ann. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you just for this morning. And-